Good morning. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Friends, my name's Pastor Matthias. Welcome to worship here at Leroy UMC and a very happy Father's Day uh, to all the fathers uh, worshiping with us this morning here in person uh, or online. A very special welcome to folks who are joining us uh, online from home, from work, uh, from the car. Hopefully if you're joining from the car, it's audio and not uh, visual. Uh, but friends, before we get started this morning, uh, just a, a quick update about COVID safety here. Uh, so number one, just a reminder, uh, we've been asking folks for a while, if you are uh, fully vaccinated, which is two weeks after your uh, second shot or two weeks after your one uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, you are welcome to take your mask off uh, while here in worship. Uh, if you aren't yet fully vaccinated, please uh, hang on to the mask. Uh, and this morning also, uh, we're taking a, a little bit of a, a new step as a church family. So as many of us probably know, this last week, uh, our area entered uh, phase five of the reopening plan, and that brought some changes to even our church conferences, uh, COVID uh, safety plans. Basically, it means uh, more than 70% of those over 65 are fully vaccinated, and uh, COVID hospitalizations are, are actually at a, a consistent kind of all-time low. Uh, so as a result of that and changes to our uh, church conference, guidelines, uh, we can invite those uh, who feel comfortable with it to join in singing. Uh, again, I just want to stress there is no obligation or pressure about that. I know it is a big step, but if that's something you, you would like to join in, uh, you are welcome to. Uh, lyrics will uh, be up on the screen. But friends, I would invite us to listen for the Holy Spirit moving among us as we hear our, and uh, possibly join in our first praise song. so good to me you heal my broken heart you are my father in heaven you are so good to me you heal my broken heart you are my father in heaven sing that again you are so good to me, you heal my broken heart, you are my Father in heaven. You are so good to me, you heal my broken heart, you are my Father in heaven. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. And I will sing again. right upon the clouds you ride upon the clouds you lead me to the truth you are the spirit inside me you ride upon the clouds you lead me to the truth you are the spirit inside You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. And I will sing again. You are my strong. to 
sweet song, and I will sing again. Father in heaven, you are the spirit inside me, you are the Jesus who loves me. Dear God, thank you so much for being our Father. Thank you for showing us the perfect example of how we should live and love. And God, on this Father's Day, I pray that we would try to be even more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this, this weekend, um, we went to a funeral for my uncle. Uh, he passed away suddenly. And it was in southern Indiana and you know, it was, it was sad because he's got a daughter who is pregnant with her third, and her other two boys are only three and one, and they don't understand where Papa went. And so in these times, we have to come together as a community of Christ to be fathers and father figures to those who have lost fathers, and we... Uh, take up the role when fathers of DNA fall short. And whatever role you are, male, female, becoming a father figure, a mother figure to anyone, uh, I just pray that we would take up more of those roles for our community and to be there for those in need at this time. To 
are satisfied here with you, here with you. Chains will hit the floor, broken lives restored. We couldn't ask for more here with you, here with you. Hands are lifted high. Brothers and sisters, we are, we are followers of a Savior who invites us to come and rest, to set all things down before him, to lift up every praise, to set down every burden, and we do so in prayer when we gather in moments like this. And so this morning, if you have a prayer, a joy, a concern, something that you would like us to lift up together as a church family, uh, this morning we are shifting back uh, to sharing our prayers uh, out loud. If you have a prayer, I would invite you to raise your hand. Uh, and in a moment, members of our praise band uh, will be coming around with microphones. Uh, if you just want to share that with the whole church family, and then those also joining us online uh, can also pray along with us. Uh, and also, if you are uh, worshiping online, I'd invite you, you can share any prayers uh, in the comment section, and we will be lifting those up uh, throughout the week. But friends, what, what are the joys? What are the concerns? What would we like to lift up this morning? Uh, yeah, Brian. Uh, okay, so many of you know, we, uh, the troop that this church sponsors, uh, we took to summer camp last week. Had a great week. Brian, with you, we, we give thanks for moments when, when God gives us a subtle hint that a storm may be coming, uh, when God helps us get out of the way, and we also lift up all those who are affected by the storms that, w that hit us in life. We ask, that, well, we ask that the Spirit might be there to help with cleanup and to empower folks to come and serve and volunteer. Sorry, did you have another prayer?
Amen. Thank you very much, Brian. And along with you, we give thanks to a God of, of miracles of good news. Uh, we thank God for the ways that God has been there for Dorothy in a trying time to the point that God has brought her to. And we pray that God continues to walk with your father in, in all that is ahead of him. Thank you so much, Brian. Oh, yeah, OK. sorrow and the loss of my mother who was 104 on the 11th but I have praise for 104 years well lived honoring God and bringing many people to know her um, she was the perpetual preacher if you will and she brought many to know him that probably wouldn't have she argued with people at the nursing home anytime she was there <laughs> and taught them the correct way. But that was just my mom. And I'm proud of her life and all the blessings that everyone has bestowed on me since then. Okay, with you, we only give thanks to a God who blesses us that we might bless others, a God who teaches us that we might be a teacher to others. We thank God for the ways that God blessed your mother to be a blessing, to be a teacher, to be someone who was always there for so many people. And we also pray that God might be there for you and for Dave in this time of loss. But thank you very much, Kay. Are there other prayers we'd like to lift up this morning? Any joys, any concerns? Yeah, Sharon. I think you have a joy. Um. <laughs> I, I do. Uh, so I'm uh, officially on probation, I should mention. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so yesterday, uh, yeah, I was um, commissioned uh, in the I IGRC, the, uh, our church conference, uh, commissioned as a probationary elder. It's uh, the step before full uh, ordination. If they still like me after two years, I get the final thumbs up. Uh, but no, thank you very much, Sharon. I'm uh, thankful, oh, thankful for the ways this church family has helped me get to this point and looking forward to the years ahead. Thank you very much. Are there any other prayers I'd like to lift up together? Well, if not, then friends, as one people who are called together, not by ourselves, but as one people who are called together by Christ, as a people who relate to one another and to all things through Christ Jesus, I would invite us to join our hearts and minds together in Christ. We take ourselves before the Lord in prayer. Friends, let us pray. Holy God, to worship you is to be fixed on you, to be still in every blessing and loss and know that you are God. Lord, you have made us in your image. You have called us valuable. You have written epic stories in the books of our lives. You have made plans and dreams for us that are beyond our imagining. So Lord, help our hearts to be fixed on you in this moment, that our spirits may know that you are God and that you are for us. God of power and might be our rock and our redemption, our defender, our well in every season of drought, our promising road through every difficult wilderness. And Lord, let us give praise and thanks for all the ways that you move among us. God, shape our lives, mold our hearts, and with every small miracle and blessing we give you thanks for, and with every struggle that we trust to your care in the stillness of our minds and in the silence of this moment. Holy God, let us worship you this and every moment 
as we let ourselves be still, as we trust that you are God. We ask this in the name of Christ, our Savior among us, our hope beside us, and our teacher who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, this morning uh, we are continuing with our sermon series on rest uh, and talking about how rest is something that God doesn't just want for us, but something that God commands that we take time for. It is in many ways the hardest uh, commandment. As we've been going through the series, we've taken a look so far at rest as something that we were made for. Uh, rest as an act of worship. That's something I believe uh, Rock, Roxy talked about last week. And this morning, uh, we're taking a look at rest as something that frees us or keeps us from idols in our lives. Kind of a unique take on rest. Uh, and we're taking a look this morning at uh, Ezekiel chapter 20. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel is a prophet we don't often talk about in church. He doesn't get a whole lot of attention in worship services. That's probably because he is one of the most uh, controversial prophets in the scriptures. Uh, in fact, here's, here's your fun fact of the week. It's a little bit off topic, but Ezekiel was so controversial as a prophet, there were actually some Jewish traditions that wouldn't allow anyone under 30 to read the book of Ezekiel. Uh, which means I'm actually about three or four months shy of being able to give this sermon. We're being very rebellious this morning. Uh, just wanted to prepare you all for that. But we're taking a look, uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 10 through 6. And just to give it some context, uh, these are actually God's words. God is speaking through Ezekiel to uh, the Israelite community uh, in this passage. But friends, listen now for the word of the Lord. I led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and showed them my ordinances by whose observance everyone shall live. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them so that they might know that I, the Lord, sanctify them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not observe my statutes, but rejected my ordinances by whose observance everyone shall live and my Sabbaths they greatly profaned. Then I thought I would pour out my wrath upon them in the wilderness to make an end of them, but I acted for the sake of my name, so that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations, in whose sight I had brought them out. Moreover, I swore to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land that I had given them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most glorious of all lands, because they rejected my ordinances, did not observe my statutes, and profane my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. 
Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, please pray with me. <clears throat> holy God, we have, seeking, we have come seeking holy truth and a life of meaning, and so only your truth and your life will do. So Lord, may we find grace and truth in this moment. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The men and women of the very first civilization in the Western world lived as slaves to idols of work. The civilization that traditionally gets credit, in the Western world at least, as being the very first civilization is the Sumerians. They lived about 5,000 years ago in the Mesopotamian River Valley. And along with inventing writing, uh, economic city planning, and you know society, the Sumerians also wrote some of the very first creation stories that we have. We actually still have many of these stories that they wrote. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the Epic of Atrahasis, the myth of Enki and Ninma, and so on. And in all of these epic myths and cosmic accounts of creation, the Sumerians consistently expressed their belief that human beings had been created by their gods in order to work. In the beginning, they believed, the gods of the Sumerian pantheon had created human beings to be servants, whose sole purpose in life was to meet every need and every want that the gods might have, and to spend every minute of their lives performing all of the hard labor that the gods didn't want to do themselves. Plowing fields, building temples, baking, sewing, you name it. Simply put, according to the men and women of the very first civilization, we are born to be slaves to idols of relentless, endless work. Now, I'll admit to many of us, maybe to most of us, that probably sounds interesting, but also pretty absurd. It's probably bizarre in many ways to imagine people spending their whole lives breaking their backs to make dead stone idols happy, but in many other ways, if you really think about it, that ancient view of life is not all that ancient. It may not even be all that strange to some of us. We would never in a million years say that the meaning of life is to work constantly. You will never see that on an inspirational poster in an office. But how many people today spend every day and every week running from one labor to the next, to the next, to the next, without really stopping? Or how many people catch themselves sometimes assuming in the back of their minds that this project, this goal, this promotion, this dream is going to give their life meaning, that this work is something I was born to do. Then again, we'd never bow down and worship statues of ancient idols like Enki and Ninma. We're enlightened modern people. But how many people today treat career, home, education, finances as the ultimate priority of their life. Something to work for, to sacrifice for, labor towards, and serve almost like an object of worship. Idols aren't just stone statues. There are all sorts of things that can take God's place in our lives. And we would never call ourselves slaves or servants. We are free independent choice makers, but let's be honest, how many people today don't just work non-stop, but do so because they feel they have to, because they feel trapped by work? I mean, 
We can't say no to the boss who pays our bills. We can't say no to the extracurricular activities that will look good on our children's record. We can't say no to our friends who are all going to that one event or that one program. We don't want to be left out or left behind. Sure, we'd like to rest, but we can't, at least not right now. We have to keep going, so we work and we work and we work until one day we wake up to find ourselves as slaves to our own modern-day idols. Idols we've carved out of careers, schools, relationships, plans, dreams that demand we work but never allow us time to really rest. The men and women of the very first civilization basically lived as slaves to idols of work and 5,000 years later, things haven't really changed all that much. Not long after the Sumerians wrote their epic myths about the idols that made and enslaved them, far to the west of Mesopotamia, another culture developed a very different view of creation. They were a much smaller society, they'd never be a great empire like the Sumerians, but unlike the Sumerians, these people believed in a strange god called Yahweh, who, according to their creation story, called Genesis, had created human beings in God's own image, and then told them not just to work, but bizarrely and even absurdly for the time, had actually told them to rest. As surprising as it may sound, in an ancient world dominated by idols that demanded constant work, rest may actually have been one of the most revolutionary, radical, and even scandalous things about the God of Israel. As the great Jewish scholar Abraham Heschel once pointed out, rest in the Hebrew scriptures is menua. I am probably butchering that, but menua. And as Heschel wrote to the biblical mind, menua, rest, is the same as happiness and stillness, as peace and harmony. Rest, these strange Israelites believed, was somehow a part of God's vision for life, a life of happiness, of stillness, a life of peace. Rest was an act of worship to a God who personally rested on the seventh day in creation, and more than that, rest for the Israelites meant freedom from all of those false idols out to make people slaves to work. That's something about Sabbath rest that we often miss. It makes sense for rest to be a part of God's plan for our lives, and it makes sense for the Sabbath to be a day of worship, but what we seldom appreciate is that our God also gives us manua rest as a sacred habit to keep false idols of work from taking over our lives. And of all the Jewish poets, patriarchs, prophets, and priests who ever appreciated that value of Sabbath rest, one of the most important was Ezekiel. Long after the Sumerians were gone and forgotten, Ezekiel was one of thousands of Israelites who was taken away to exile in Babylon in the year 587. It's the great Babylonian exile, and Ezekiel was a part of it. Which means that Ezekiel, the prophet, lived in a culture filled with false idols and spent all of his life as a teacher and a prophet trying to help that exiled community remember their God of rest in a foreign land. And while there is a lot that you could say about Ezekiel and a lot that you could say about that overall pretty bleak passage in uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, the thing to notice and the thing I hope we take away from that largely disheartening scripture passage is the incredible 
value and encouraging sense of liberation that Ezekiel places on Sabbath as a sign from God in our lives. God speaks to the exiled Israelites about their ancestors who came long before them. And in verse, in verse 10, God says, I led them out from the land of Egypt. In other words, this God started his relationship with the people by freeing them from a life of endless, merciless labor. I gave them my statutes, God says. I showed them my ordinances. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them so that they might know that I, the Lord, sanctify them. That speaks volumes about how essential rest, manua, is to the God that we worship. In a world that often demands so much of us, that often tries to make us slaves to work into different projects, God gave the people, gave us rest as a sign to remind them every single week of their relationship to the Lord. God calls us to rest as an expression of our covenant with the strange creator God, Yahweh, who gave us life not just to work, but to live in God's peace. I mean, think about it this way. For Ezekiel, there is a direct link between our ability to set aside little moments in our week when we can be still and rest with God and our ability to keep and honor the first commandment, that I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. I mean, notice that later when God laments the fact that the people eventually did forget to rest and profaned my Sabbaths in verse 16, God says it happened because their heart went after their idols. More than a luxury, more than an impossibility, and more than a simple command to obey, rest is meant to be the one constant in our weekly, regular schedule that keeps us from allowing all the little priorities of our lives from somehow taking over our lives. Being still and resting with God is how we remember that God has our ultimate allegiance instead of that school, that program, that boss, and those people who would exhaust us and wear us down with endless labor. When we forget to rest, we lose the sign from the God of peace and lose ourselves, more often than not, to work. But when we keep it, when we remember to be still and trust that God is God, when we carve out a life-giving second to stop and feel the Sabbath peace that God wants for us, then as Ezekiel knew, we don't just find a moment of peace with our God, but we find freedom from all the things that try to take God's peace from us. And in the end, that's, that's the hope of that passage. That's the good news that the God of Israel has to offer that the Sumerian idols never could. Sabbath rest isn't just something that we were made for. Rest is God's sign of freedom in our lives. It's freedom that says, yes, if I took on that extra project, I might make my boss like me a bit more, but I don't have to if that project will make my life unbearable because I was created for more than just completing work projects. It's the freedom to admit to ourselves, yes, I like being part of the group, but I don't have to be a part of every group, every club, every committee, and every little thing. I can say no sometimes because my sense of meaning 
doesn't come from being endlessly busy or from being popular, and it is the freedom to miraculously say with the confidence of faith that that program, that degree, that job, that placement, that social life, that thing in your life that demands so much from you cannot demand your every day and can never be the Lord of your life because the one who is Lord is the one who says, rest. Be calm, be at peace, be happy, be joyful for a change, be still and know that I am God and that I already love and redeem you. You don't have to work for it. Sabbath rest is, in the end, the freedom to know who is truly Lord of our life and freedom to be children of God's peace rather than slaves to some idol's work. 5,000 years ago, the men and women of the very first civilization in the Western world lived as slaves to idols of work. And 5,000 years later, we are all still tempted to live in the same way sometimes. Like Ezekiel, in a foreign land, we are surrounded by all sorts of idols, all sorts of things that demand we give them everything, our every hope, our every effort, our every second of time. There are so many false gods that will trap us in endless cycles of work if we let them and lie that we can't stop. But it's in the midst of that ancient foreign land and it is facing those idols that the strange God of Israel and of Ezekiel still offers us the sign and the freedom of rest. The permission to be still and feel peace if only for a day. The hope to stop and love God's good creation if only for a moment and the sign between God and us that points the way to the Lord who created us in love, not in work, and who offers us new life, not labor. And thanks be to God for it. Amen. Friends, please pray with me. Holy God, give us the strength, the will, and the freedom to rest this morning, this day, this week, this month. God, our true creator, show us the Sabbath sign that you have placed in our lives and let our rest remind us every week of the stillness and the peace that you designed us for. Lord, let the demands, the obligations of our week never become our reason for living, but let us always remember that you are our every reason. You give us meaning, you have authority, and your will for us is peace. God, our creator, let us be children of your peace more than we are servants of work. And Lord, in resting with you, let us find new life. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as people created by a God of peace, as servants of Christ Jesus, a Lord who offers us rest, this morning we worship God not only in words, not only in thoughts, but by joining with Christ Jesus in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Uh, for folks who may be worshiping with us online, I would invite you to find uh, any bread, any crackers, wine, uh, water, grape juice, anything that might serve as elements, and to join us uh, in the liturgy. Uh, also a reminder, we do have uh, responses. If you would like to join, they will be uh, up on the screen in a moment. Uh, in a moment, the ushers will dismiss us by row to come forward and retrieve uh, the packets. Then we will participate together. And friends, as a reminder, here in the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion, which means any and all who are willing may participate. 
This table belongs to the God who made us, a God of peace, a God of rest and grace, and that grace is there for all those who seek it. So friends, let us join ourselves together in prayer as we respond to the Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Christ Jesus, it is right and a good thing always to praise you. For Christ, it is in your grace that we find peace. It is in your good news that we find hope. It is in your redemption that we find the life. So Christ Jesus, come and sit at this table with us, and by your presence, let us find life at it. Savior, let our hearts be still and our minds at ease as we partake of these elements that our spirits might rest and walk by faith each day that lies ahead of us. Lord, pour out your spirit on all of your children gathered here and wherever we may be, and on these gifts of bread and wine that we worship with. Make them for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ. Amen. Friends, I would invite you to come forward as the ushers dismiss and as you feel led. Friends, I'd invite you to find the bread. On the night in which our Savior gave himself up for us, he took bread, 
gave thanks to God, broke it, turned and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, all of you. This is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. Friends, the body of Christ broken for you. I invite you to find the juice. In the same way, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, drink, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me, friends, the blood of Christ shed for you. Holy Lord, it is in remembrance of your sacrifice for us in Christ Jesus that we partake of these elements, entrusting our hearts to your grace, entrusting our dreams to your plans, and entrusting our lives to your hope. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. And friends, before we hear our final praise song, uh, I did just want to remind you all this month we have a special uh, joy offering uh, through our church. Uh, as Roxy explained last Sunday, this month our church is uh, supporting the ISU Merge Foundation. It's the uh, Methodist Campus Ministry at ISU. Uh, our church has been partnered with Merge for a long time. It is a fantastic campus ministry 